Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, so last time you finished here, uh, we talked a little bit about ports. So before I start, I want to jump back to the two diagrams that we had uh, and like see if anybody has a, any questions about it. If it's not clear, I can try to make that clear. Uh, otherwise, like the reason I'm doing this is that this is pretty much like where we're going to start uh, implementing in C++. So it's really important that we have everything clear here. So about these two things. OK. OK. So I'm going to go over them as a reminder. Uh, so two types of ports in Gem5, request port, response port. Um, the concept of peers. So every request port is connected to another response port. So the types should be different. Uh, some objects have ports. So usually, like you'll see in your code, that the code of the sim object calls a function from the port, like uh, send timing request. That automatically calls receive timing request on the peer. Then peer probably needs to handle it, which means that it'll probably call a function from the sim object that owns it. And then that'll respond something this signal propagates back. If the, res the responder sim object has a bandwidth, basically, to receive that request. And again, bandwidth is more like a non-technical term in this context right now. Like, for example, if your cache has enough miss status handling registers, like when you get a miss, it'll return true. If it doesn't have any left, it'll return false. Uh, and then like the responder object starts you know, executing, like simulating what it's supposed to do. Time moves on. And then at some point, the response for that request is ready, and then it becomes the responsibility of the responder object to send the response back, which it does by calling send timing response on the response port, which it in turn calls re receive timing response on the request port. So something to note, request ports send requests, receive responses. Response ports receive requests, send responses. And we'll see in the code that only functions that relate to receiving are pure virtual functions. That's basically because like sending is fairly straightforward. You get the peer, ask the peer to receive. Everything clear? OK, cool. Uh, more details here. OK, so what we're going to do is call, like, develop a sim object called Inspector Gadget. It's a gadget that inspects. Um, um, so there are four steps in this set of slides, three of which are developed. The set, and then fourth, the, the fourth step is uh, fairly simple compared to the first three. Um, so at the high level, this is what you should be modeling at, like, when you finish the fourth step. But at the first step, we're going to basically model this part. So um, the sim object is going to have a CPU side port or a request, sorry, a response port called CPU side because it's connected to the side of the system that is on the side of CPU. It's going to have a request port called mem side port. Um, and it's going to have this buffer called the inspection buffer. Uh, at the first step, it's not going to do any. We're not going to try to model any inspection. And then we, 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 I can talk a little bit about what I mean by modeling inspection. Um, and like inspection is fairly trivial for the context of this tutorial. Um, then like we're just basically going to get requests, put them in this inspection buffer, then send them uh, through the memory side port to the memory, get the responses, and then forward the responses back. Right? So we're just forwarding requests and responses, nothing specific. But you'll see that it'll take us 73 slides to get there. Um, and then we're also going to parameterize the size of these buffers, because you, you cannot have infinite size buffers in your hardware. Any questions? Great. Um, OK, so before we start, uh, Writing code, I want to talk about clocked object. So 
clocked object is a class that inherits from some object. It lets you uh, see time uh, in the concepts of cycles, not ticks. So again, it'll return you ticks, but like you can ask it, give me the time of the second cycle in the future. So not the next cycle or the, the cycle after that, or you can ask it to give you the time of the next cycle in ticks. So it rids you of uh, uh, having to deal with ticks and convert those to clocks. You'll see that the clocked object has a parameter called clock domain. So that's where you set the clock frequency and everything for that clocked object. But we're not going to see that in C++. We're just going to call these functions called clocked object, next cycle, or clock period. So we can get all of these in ticks. OK, so let's go ahead and like create the files. So again, now let's try to stay organized. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create a directory under source bootcamp. Oh, sorry. I can hear you almost. Yeah, yeah. So a clocked object is a sim object. So it inherits from some object. It extends it with like a parameter called clock domain. So if, again, the question was, what's the relationship between clocked object and sim object? A clocked object is a sim object. Um, it just extends the class sim object with one parameter, or maybe more. Like the, the one parameter that we care about is clock domain. So I'm going to go ahead and create a directory under bootcamp called inspector gadget. Um, so you all should also go ahead and do that. Uh, and I'm going to create the sim object declaration file, the scon script, and everything else that I need for it. So notice that. This the file scan script file okay. so. By the way, please let me know if I make any typos. I realize that. I always get the P and S wrong, like misplaced. Sorry. Oh, this is a directory. Thank you. I can't hear you. Oh, OK. Now, uh, let's go ahead to slide 17. So instead of uh, this being a sim object, it's a clocked object. So we're going to import clocked object in Python. So what I'm going to do is copy the code block from slide 17 into inspectorgadget.py. Um, Let me open up the slides on my end. Then I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste the rest of the code block from slide 18. So nothing very different from some object or hello some object. Again, all those keywords uh, from hello some object. <laughs> 
So again, type. I strongly caution you to use the same name as the name of the class in Python, path to the C++ header file, and name of the C++ class. Uh, so nothing that much different, except that instead of this being some object, it's clocked object here. So <clears throat> now the next step is to uh, tell Jump5 that this sim object has ports, or this clocked object, rather, has ports. So if you want to know where ports are defined, they're defined under m5.params. Uh, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is copy and paste that code block from slide 19 and add it to my import statements. So from m5.params import star. Again, fairly convenient that both params and ports are defined under the same thing. We don't need to import too many things. So the next step is to just basically define the ports at Python level, and we'll see how to access them in C++ later. Um, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is copy and paste the first code block in slide 21 under Inspector Gadget. Uh, make sure to follow the correct indentation. So what I'm doing here is, again, response port and requ request port are both defined under m5.params. Um, so and CPU side port, we're just saying it's a re response port, and we're giving a description for that response port. Uh, and mem side port is a request port, uh, and we're giving a de description for that as well. So we talked about having two buffers, one inspection buffer and one response buffer. So let's go ahead and add parameters for the size of those buffers in hardware. So the size we're now going to describe as the number of entries. So let's say that you have a FIFO structure. It has a certain number of entries. So let's add parameters that describe the size of those as number of entries. So I'm going to go ahead and copy the second code block from slide 21 uh, under inspector gadget.py. So again, I like fairly descriptive names. So inspection buffer entries uh, is the name of my parameter. Um, you'll see, it again, um, that we're going to ha have these available as inspector gadget params in C++. Any questions so far? Great. Um, OK. Mm -hmm. So now the next step is, again, let's do everything that we need to do at Python and then start developing things in C++. Uh, let's open the SCON script and just add the code block in slide 23 there. It's, again, nothing that much different. Well, I, not, nothing different from hello sim object. Again, I'm defining a sim object on, from uh, inspector gadget.py with the name inspector gadget. I'm defined like um, I'm declaring inspector gadget.cc as a source file, and I'm also uh, creating a debug file called inspector gadget. Like forward looking because I know I'll probably run into bugs, so I just define it uh, at, at the first step. Uh, now we have created the header files. Let's go ahead and um, copy and paste the code block in slide 25 in inspector gadget.hh. Again, you should by now be familiar with this, including the parameters of the sim object, uh, the clocked object, rather. But again, it's also a sim object. And like the source for clocked object. So this, sorry, the header file for a clocked object. And it's under sim uh, slash clocked object.hh. Uh, we're defining a class called inspector gadget, which inherits from public object. It has two private members, inspection buffer entries. So we're going to initialize inspection buffer entries in C++ for, uh, by using the parameter from Python. Same for response buffer entries. 
Also, if you remember, every sim object needs to have a constructor like that, where uh, the prototype of the function is basically one input, which is a const uh, of the parameter structure for that sim object. OK, so again, um, another thing that I want to do here is uh, copy and paste this definition of a function called align. We'll see how this becomes useful later. Um, this is one of those moments where you have to kind of trust me. So let's define uh, this function that takes a tick when and returns another tick that aligns that tick to a clock cycle time of the some object. So let's say something happens at, at a time that is not aligned with uh, an edge of a clock cycle. We're going to respond to it at an edge of a clock cycle in the future. So inside our sim like clocked object, we have access to our clock. So we can align everything with that. Um, that's that is a possibility, like especially if like you're trying to do some of the events on the falling edge, maybe some of them on the rising edge. So one specific case is like the sim object that is connected to the request to the response port, or the request port might not have the same clock domain as us. So they might call into functions, uh, and when at that time current tick might not be aligned to uh, the clock edge of our sim object. Does that make sense? So let's say I'm run, like Inspector Gadget is running at 2 gigahertz. The L3 cache is running at 3 gigahertz. The L3 cache is going to call functions like receive timing request at like steps of like 333 ticks. We only see at 200, and, sorry, 500 ticks. So we have to align those things. So this is what align does. So to define it, I'm going to also go ahead and copy and paste the code block in slide 27 in inspectorgadget.cc. So we start by defining a line first. Oh, I think I had it open here. Yes. So this is one of the cases where like, you have to um, OK, so we should remember to add the include statements later. Uh, so read through this later on and see if this makes sense to you. What I'm doing is basically calculating the time difference and counting it as the number of clock cycles, but I'm using the ceiling of that and ask this clocked object to return that many cycles in the future. So clock edge takes a per integer parameter is like a number, or sorry, a parameter of so type cycles, which you can think of as a unsigned int, um, then returns the tick of the clock cycle that is that many cycles into the future. Um, so next up. Yes. So clock period is exactly the number of ticks per period. Like, uh, yeah, the clock period described as ticks. And again, I did a, mentally I thought about this a little bit. This might be one clock into the future. Like you might be over, like over, predicting here. <laughs> uh, but again, like this is a best effort. So you can go ahead and well, go home, think about this, and see, well, th this is wrong, or this needs to be improved. But for the purposes of this tutorial, it doesn't. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think it might be built in. Uh, so I realized that after I developed the slides. Thank you for noticing. I think, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think if you look at the update, uh, you can ask the clock object to like update its time 
somehow or um, yeah I don't know if it's built in like I didn't like look deep into it but we can still define a line uh, okay so since we're also using uh, ceiling let's go ahead and include cmath in our .cc file um, uh, you should do that by copying the second code block in slide 27. Okay, so now back to the header file. So what we want to do is create ports in C++. Um, and we'll see how we will do it. So if you remember, ports and packets work together to move data. Basically, ports use move packets around and packets hold the data or the request or the response. Um, Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add that here, again, sticking to the alphabetical order of things. Uh, so they are both defined under mem slash port.hh or pa packet.hh. Uh, okay, so if you remember, request port and response port classes were abstract classes, which means that we have to extend them to be able to instantiate objects from them. To do that, um, First, let's extend the request port. Sorry, the response port. Um, so again, this is uh, like good programming practices. Gen5 has a very big code base. Um, the chances are that, well, the, so it is possible that you use a name that collides with another function defined by someone else. So if you are Defining a class that is useful within the context of like specific sum object, define that class inside the declaration of this sum object. So to do this, copy and paste the code block from slide 29 under the private of inspector gadget in inspector gadget.hh. So what I did was copy and paste this whole thing. This whole thing from slide 29 into inspector gadget.hh. So uh, I'm going to let you all look at this a little bit. So um, if you remember, so let's skip over the, these members for now. Uh, I'm defining a CPU side port class that inherits from response port. My aim is to extend response port so that it's not uh, an abstract class anymore. And these are all the functions that we need to override from response port. These functions that are, are functions that I've defined for my own convenience. Uh, send packet basically wraps around uh, send timing request. Sorry. Uh, Send packet wraps around send time, timing response, which makes things easier for me. So it's to, this is these three is, are not totally necessary. Uh, I mean, in the sense that you are not required by re response board to define them, but for the sake of convenience, uh, I have to find them here. So we talked about having a pure virtual function called receive timing request. Uh, so that was on the response board. We definitely need to define this for a CPU side port. There's receive atomic, receive functional, and receive response retry. So we didn't look at those uh, protocols, the protocols because, well, they are fairly straightforward. Uh, we'll see how to implement them fairly soon. And then receive response retry is one of the retry paths in our interactions with our ports. So the one function that we didn't talk about was this get address ranges. So every response port in Gen5 uh, has to return a list of address ranges, or an address li range list, uh, that it is responsible for. So like, imagine a dual channel memory system. So one of your channels is going to be responsible for a subset of all of your physical address space, and the other channel is going to be responsible for 
the remainder of that. So to, do, uh, to basically figure out where packets should go, get address ranges, asks response ports to return a list of address ranges that they are responsible for. So it's not one item, it's a list of address ranges. Um, so and then uh, apart from that, now let's go back and see what we have here. So I have a pointer to an object of Inspector Gadget. This pointer helps me ask Inspector Gadget to implement the receive timing request and all those receive functions for me. So you'll see that uh, when we define these functions, we basically call the owner and with the, like the same, a function with the same name from owner and have the owner handle that for us. Um, a Boolean that like, is useful for us to remember uh, whether we have to send or retry in the future. So uh, if we go back to slide something, slide nine, uh, in the scenario that the responder is busy, it has to send a retry request in the future. So when we reject a request, we set need to send retry to true. Uh, and then wherever we figure out that we have become available, we send uh, a retry, a request retry or retry request. And then a packet pointer, uh, a pointer to a packet that has been blocked. So can someone tell me so what, what this packet type will be, would it be a response or a request? So what type of, so what cap packets are going to be blocked that it is the responsibility of CPU site port to track? Yeah. So they're under packet.hh. Uh, oh, sorry. Packet.hh. Here. Yes. They're like a container class, basically. Like, there's a lot of information inside them. Um, so they have attributes like is read, all those things. Um, yeah. So. If we go to packet.hh, um, so there are two functions that return Boolean for the packet, is response or is request. So let's say during the simulation, if I were to call is request unblocked packet, would it return true or false? Can we, again, this blocked packet. The blocked packet that the CPU side port, which is a response port, uh, tracks. Do you want to answer? Like, I see you. No? Ayrton, no? No. So, well, depends. So, my decision is the responder remembers that it has to send a retry. The requester tracks the request that was blocked. So this is a response port. So the one that the response port should track is the response, port, response packet that was blocked. So again, so these two relate to two different contexts. So this is to remember that we need to send retry. This is remember the response packet that was blocked by the requester. Right, so, um, so two different contexts. Again, this goes back to that scenario where the responder tries to send a response, but the requester cannot receive the response. But again, like, I feel like that's kind of like unrealistic, like usually the requester makes sure that there's room, there's bandwidth to receive the response. And when I'm saying bandwidth, I'm not talking about like link, like this is your wires bandwidth. Sorry for the lack of accuracy in my words. Uh, it's like 
capacity to receive it again. <laughs> capacity also has a technical term. Um, so, like for example, your cache first allocates a, an entry for a miss and then asks for the memory to send that data. So it's not like the data arrives at the cache and the cache says, oh shoot, I had a miss, but I forgot to allocate for it. Oops, sorry. Hold it back. Let me allocate. Um, so again, this is something you should have in mind when developing. You can, again, think about this a little bit. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not necessarily completely true that requesters have to always make it possible. Again, this is not necessarily like a link being busy. This is requester not having space to get the response. Um, OK, so now let's go ahead and think, uh, copy and paste slide 31, the code block there, under CPU side port. So we're also, OK. So what I did was like copy and paste this part from slide 31. Here. Uh, again, same three variables, a pointer uh, to an inspector gadget object that owns that port, uh, need to send retry. So this is remember to send retries. So this is sending retry to who? Memory. What kind of Retries are we sending? Like, what are we telling memory to retry? Uh, receiving request. Receiving request. No. So it's receiving response. Again, in this scenario, Inspector Gadget is a requester to the memory. So when we're, so notice that Inspector Gadget is both a responder and a requester. When, like, to the CPU side of things, it's a responder. To the memory, it's a requester. Right? So this is where we need to remember to tell memory to retry sending the response that we asked it for. Right? For response. Now, like CPU side port, this is to a totally different context. So what type of packet will pack block packet be here? Is it a request or a response? <laughs> Sorry, I know this is, I didn't ask the question very accurately. So it's going to be a request because it's our responsibility to track the packet that was rejected, right? Hmm. So when we try to send something to the memory and memory says, no, I don't have space to accept your request, we say, fine, I'll keep track of it in block packet. All right. And then let's go over these three functions. So again, send packet is something that like, I just added for my convenience. Need retry is returning whether we need to send a retry to memory controller. So we're going to ask memory controller or whatever memory side to retry sending responses. Blocked returns whether we, like, the memory side port is blocked. So again, to totally two different concepts, so contexts. Um, so that's useful when we, we are trying to see if we can send something through the memory side port. And if we are already blocked, we don't send it, right? There's no point in sending something we, when we know we are already blocked. Make sense? At least a little bit. OK, so now that we have declared these two classes, let's go ahead and declare objects of these two, class, two classes. So in here. So I'm going to create a CPU side port, CPU side port. And Mem side port, mem side port. 
So you can do that by copy and pasting the two lines from slide 33 under private. So, uh, yeah. so now we have declared that Inspector Gadget has two ports. One of them is a CPU side port, another one is MEM side port. Now, we talked about like, when you call m5.instantiate, it connects ports, right? Like there was a step where if you go to m5.instantiate at Python, there's object.connect port. So, and let's see like, how some object helps Python uh, make this happen. So if you go to, uh, well, you, you don't have to go to it right now, but uh, the, the declaration for a sim object has this function, uh, which is a virtual function that returns a reference to a port. So um, if you go to slide 35 and copy and paste the whole code block or well, the, the line under public, so this is a public and virtual function from some object. So this is something that we will never call. Gen5 calls this for us when it's trying to instantiate some objects, or rather connect ports. It'll ask the C++ backend to create a pairing between the ports in Python and ports in C++. So to do that, it'll return an interface name. Anybody want to guess what are the possible values for this in interface name? Like very, very accurately and nitpickily? Is it going to be CPU side port or MEM side port? Like this? It's, so again, the point of this function is to create a pairing between whatever we have in Python and whatever we have in C++. So anybody want to guess what the these interface names are going to be? OK. So if there are no takers, I'm going to give the answer. So they're going to be CPU side port and mem side port. So that's where the name comes from. And this happens like through the magic of Gen5. So all we have to do inside get port is create that pairing. Make sense? So if this function was to be called with CPU underscore side underscore port, what should we return? CPU side port in camel case. Um, and same thing for uh, mem side port. So now I think we have declared quite a bit. Let's go ahead and define some. Um, so let's go ahead and actually include the header files that we need. So we didn't forget, hopefully, about including the header file for Inspector Gadget and the debug flag that we defined. So to do this, I'm copy and pasting the two lines of code from slide 36 into inspectorgadget.cc. Um, again, this is the header file for the sim object or clocked object and the header file for the debug flag. OK, so if we go to slide 37, we're halfway there, by the, by the way. It's 37 of the 73. And copy and paste the whole code block from that slide here. We have now implemented get port. So again, notice there we're creating a parallel between Python and C++. So when you want to define this function, you go back to the sim object declaration file, you copy and paste the name of your uh, ports, and then create that parallel here. Right? Uh, for now, forget about what port ID is, or basically, or the, the indexes. That's useful when you have vector ports like ports that can have multiple peers. We're not going to see how they work. For now, assume that we're not going to be dealing with this index, at least as far as we are concerned. And if we cannot find an interface name, we're going to ask clocked object to handle that for us. So pretty conventional. Like For now, 
trust me that this is how you should implement it, and we can move on. Let's get started again. Uh, if we go to slide 38, we'll see a list of uh, functions that we needed to uh, define for CPU side port. So these four functions, get address ranges, uh, receive timing request, receive atomic, and receive functional. So I'm going to start by getting the easy things out of the way first. Uh, so that will be get address ranges, receive atomic, and receive functional. Um, so let's start by receive atomic and receive functional. Um, OK. So if you go to slide 39 and copy and paste the whole code block from there into inspectorgadget.cc, that's like the whole implementation of those two functions. OK, so I've done that. And we're going to take a look at uh, what these functions are doing. So all we're doing is dprintf something that we received a, received a packet in atomic mode. And we're, then we're asking the inspector gadget object to return the result of atomic access. Fairly simple. Like, we just rem like ask the inspector gadget to do it. Same thing for receive functional. So this is for res like servicing functional requests. Dprintf receive packet in functional mode. And again, calling the owner to do that for us. Then let's go ahead and uh, define the get address ranges function. If you go to slide 40 and copy and paste the code block from there in inspectorgadget.cc, you will have defined the get address ranges. Again, fairly simple. Uh, we're going to ask the owner some object to return a list of address ranges. So note that as we go, like going through the definition of these functions, we're also kind of declaring new functions, because right now the inspector gadget class does not have get address ranges, doesn't have a receive atomic uh, function, and it also doesn't have a receive functional. So this is going to happen throughout your development. You're going to be realizing, oh, I need a function. So it's good that you kind of assume that it exists and like, make a note that you have to define it later. So I want to ask a question really quick. So one thing that you might have noticed here is that we're defining a get address range for the CPU side port, but not for the mem side port. Any reason why? So if we go to port.hh, we'll see, hopefully that is where it's defined, get adder ranges. So if you see, if you look at it, for the request port, there is a get address range function. So again, the reason I know it's a request port is because like VS Code is helping me. So under request port, there's a function called get address ranges. It also has it, but it's not a pure virtual function. Whereas if we go to the response port, it's a pure virtual function. And like, it's a pure virtual function because of that equals 0. Uh, again, the reason, like, why would it not be a pure virtual function for the request port? What would it return? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so it'll return the address range list of its peer. So imagine, like again, this is useful for routing. So inside, you might, like if you're forwarding something like we're doing, we have to imagine like a scenario where we have multiple request ports. And then we have to figure out where to forward the request to. So we will ask the request ports to give us the address ranges that they are responsible for. Like they're responsible for, for, for forwarding the requests. So and they will call the peer, which is a response port, which has a get address ranges. So that's why it's not a pure virtual. OK. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, so the, I think this is the process that happens for a crossbar. So the crossbar, like I think it, maybe it's in its init function that, uh, like I mentioned, we haven't seen it in action yet. It'll ask all of its ports to give them its address ranges. So it'll ask all of its request ports to give it uh, its ad their address ranges, and then it'll create a map, like um, an internal map that knows for the, this address, like they should go to this port, to that port, or the other port. Does that make sense? So in a scenario where you have multiple request ports, you need like uh, a, an internal map. In our case, we only have one. We don't need it. Like we we know that like there's only one option. Like, and if that request port is not responsible for that address, like that's a panic, right? And we're not also responsible about panicking it. The response port that is connected to the request port will panic about it, saying, oh, I'm not responsible for this address, and I somehow I've received it. Right. OK. OK. Cool. So again, we're going to remember to declare a get address changes for the inspector gadget. Uh, now let's go ahead and actually declare them. So, okay. So if you go ahead and copy and paste the whole code block from slide forty-two, under the public of Inspector Gadget. So Inspector Gadget at HH. Here. So again, I, I like to keep things organized by context. So again, like I separate the ones that I am inheriting from sim object, like a, from the ones that I'm defining myself. And again, like do this for yourself because it helps you like later on modify your code faster, like read your code faster. Okay, so these four functions are the ones that. Uh, we need to declare for uh, uh, Inspector Gadget. Um, well, I might have skipped over one slide. That's why there's receive timing request there, and it's not defined. So let's go ahead and actually define the receive timing request. So you can do that by copy and pasting the code block in slide 41. OK, so this is a little bit more complicated than the other two receive functions. So again, what we're doing is a dprintf, uh, saying that we received a packet in timing mode. We're going to ask the owner to receive this timing request. So again, forward declaration a little bit here. And if that function returns true, we're going to return the true. Uh, and if not, we're going to remember that we're going to have to send a retry later in the future and then return false. Make sense? Like seeing need to send retry in action? OK, so now that we have defined everything that we need to declare from uh, Inspector Gadget, let's go and declare it. Uh, so these are the ones, and then let's go ahead and implement them. Or yes. OK. So a little bit of object oriented, maybe not object oriented necessarily, but a little bit of programming. So again, the point was I'm going to get requests, put them in a buffer, pop them, send them to memory, get responses, put them in a buffer, pop them, send them to the CPU, well, or the CPU side. And again, I'm going to use memory and CPU as interchangeably with memory side and CPU side. Uh, so again, I want this buffer to impose certain latency, right? So like in real hardware, when you cannot push and pop the same thing in the same cycle, we need to at least wait one cycle. So again, like, I find it helpful to like, create these utilities, 
that helped me do these things uh, like functionally instead of like me trying to figure out figure it out every time. So what I went ahead and did was like I defined this uh, template class that I wrap around standard queue. It implements uh, it basically internally has two queues like a queue that tracks the items that are inside the queue and another queue that like tracks the time that they were inserted. So like every time I'm, I'm pushing, I'm passing a time as well. So if you look at the push function from Q, you'll see that it takes T item but, or T something. But here, I'm also taking the time, and I'm also pushing that. So I'm kind of making myself kind of oblivious to this tracking of time. Uh, pop is exactly the same. I remember to pop uh, the time from the, like the, the queue that I'm tracking the times with. So this way, I'm not going to make programming mistakes, right? If I were to handle this queue in my code like, and happen to like, not keep this synchrony between the insertion times and the items, like, my simulation timing and everything might be incorrect. I'm going to get into a situation where one queue is empty. Another queue might have one or two items in it. So this is like, one of the best things you can do for yourself is like, use like object-oriented and all these things to like help you reduce the cognitive load on yourself when you're writing programs. Uh, and also, like Gen Five is already super slow, so you're not um, introducing more slowdown. Like it's a drop in an ocean. Uh, so um, then, like the front, another function that I'm adding is whether that buffer now has an item at a specific time, right? So if this buffer was to impose a certain latency, it should return false if it's empty, so it doesn't have anything ready. Otherwise, it should take the time that we're passing and the difference of that time minus the first item in this, uh, the time of the first item in this buffer should be bigger or equal to the latency. Does this make sense to everybody? Yep. Okay. Cool. And then there's another function, first ready time, which returns the first item in the times queue. Again, this is for programming sake. This, like, this does not have to have a like a one-to-one -one matching with what happens in hardware, right? I'm using this to help the programmer. Um, now, let's go ahead and copy and paste this whole code block. Or maybe not the private part. Or it's not going to hurt anything to copy that private. I just don't like having multiple like private statements. Uh, so what I did was copy and paste the whole code block on the right um, from slide 44 under private of Inspector Gadget. Again, we went through some of its functions. It's structure. It also has a private member called latency that we will use to initialize it. Since we're using standard queue, we're going to include queue. So you can do that by copy and pasting the code block on the left of slide 44 here. Any questions? No? Great. Um, OK, so now we have this timed queue that helps us like time the insertions of items in there. So let's go ahead and declare an object for the inspection buffer there. Right? So you can do that by um, copy and pasting this code block, the first code block in slide 45, under private of inspector gadget. Again, now you'll see me separating things based on context again. So since inspection buffer entries is tracking the number of entries in that time queue, I'm putting it next to there. We'll see in the future slides that we need another time queue for the response buffer. So let's ju just go ahead and do that right now. So 
So this is, again, breaking out of the slides a little bit, like jumping a little bit into for, like the, to the future. What you need to do is copy and paste the line that defines inspection buffer and define another buffer called response buffer. So response buffer takes responses from memory. We put them there and then take them out of there and send them to the CPU side. Any questions? So now I have, instead of like, unlike the slides, I have declared two timed queues. So you'll see in the future slides that you're going to have to add that, but let's just go ahead and add that right now. Any questions? Billy, where are you? Uh, OK. OK, so now let's, uh, again, I like to get the easy things out of the way. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and implement get address ranges from inspector gadget and receive functional from inspector gadget. So the way that I like to do here, again, my personal preference is there is this pairing between functions in the port and the sim object, so I'll put them next to each other. So I'm going to copy, copy and paste get address ranges from the code block in slide 46 into inspectorgadget.cc, so the, only that first part. So fairly simple implementation, so again, CPU side port get address ranges calls owner get address ranges. Owner is an object of inspector gadget. Inspector get address ranges calls mem side port get address ranges. We're done with it. Like we don't need to do anything else. Mem side port calls its peers get address ranges, and we return the actual address ranges that we're responsible for. Receive functional. Um, to, do, to implement that, I'm copy and pasting the second uh, function or the second definition. So that's for receive functional uh, of inspector gadget. And don't forget if you, like me, fail to copy and paste the void to copy and paste, type it there. So I copied the definition of receive functional. Uh, for inspector gadget under receive function receive functional for CPU side port, not receive atomic. All right, so this is how it works. Like we're gonna ask mem side port to receive this functional. We're done. Um, next up, receive atomic. So let's go ahead and copy and paste the code block from slide 47. under receive functional from CPU side port. OK, so let's take a step back and talk about this a little bit. So receive atomic, again, uh, what I'm doing here is asking mem side port to send atomic, which in turn will call receive atomic on its peer. And I'm adding clock period to that. So if you remember, receive atomic was responsible for sending a tick value that was equivalent to the access latency. Again, it's not at all realistic in the sense that memory accesses are not necessarily atomic all the time, but this function treats them all as atomic. So what we're going to do, we're going to add one clock period because that's how long it takes to push and pop the request uh, into and from inspection buffer. Make sense? Makes sense why I'm like adding one clock period. Is there anybody who is confused about this clock period plus mem side port dot send atomic packet? Great. Okay. So now off to the next step, which is defining receive timing request. Okay, so to do that, I'm copy and pasting the code block in slide 48 under CPU side port receive timing request. Oh. What did I do? Okay, cool. So 
let's take a look at this function. Maybe I should highlight it a little bit. OK, so what I'm doing is checking. So inspection buffer is a time queue which in itself wrap, like itself wraps Q, which has a function called size that returns the number of entries or number of items in the queue. So if the number of items in that queue are bigger or equal to inspection buffer entries, which will be initialized with the parameter that we get from Python, we should return false, right? We have run out of space in that inspection buffer. Is this clear to everyone, or is anybody who is confused why we're doing this? We're doing this because we don't want to like, create this infinite queue, right? If we don't enforce this, C++ lets you insert as many items as you want into this, maybe until you run out of memory on your host. Don't know when it'll stop, but otherwise, if we have space, we just push that packet into inspection buffer, and we also record its insertion time, which will be current tick. Make sense? And then we will return true. OK, so let's say I went ahead and implemented every other function in this um, small object, right? And I kept receive timing request like this. What will happen if I start simulating? Like, I know it's a very long step to get to that prediction. Will packets be forwarded to memory? N no. Um, so far, what I've done is like get the packets, put them in the buffer, and done, right? So does anybody want to guess what we need to do to forward them? And also consider that we want to impose latency. We impose latency. What do we do to model latency? Scheduling. Scheduling what? Event. So. Great. So we need another event, right? So, so far, we have put stuff in the inspection buffer. We need to take stuff out of it. And we want to schedule an event one cycle into the future whenever we insert. Does that make sense? OK. So let's go ahead and declare that then. So if you go to slide 50, what do we need to include? to declare event or event function wrappers, rather, sim slash eventq.hh. So do that by copy and pasting um, the first code block in slide 50. So E is after C. Yes. So I added this line because the definition for event function wrapper is in eventq.hh. And next, I'm going to copy and paste the two lines from slide 50 the, uh, in the bottom code block to the private of inspector gadget. So, OK, again, context a little bit and order here. So. I also like to define my ports first. I'm just copy and pasting them. You don't have to do it. Just, I mean, actually do it if you're like, doing the programming, because when I write the constructor, there needs to be a parallel. So I like to do, define my things first, like, or my variables first, uh, and then uh, get to the queues and stuff like that. OK. So, what I did was I declared an event function wrapper or an event called next request send event. So this is an event that is going to send the next request, or it's an event next request send. So it's going to request send for us. Uh, we need a callback function for it, process next request send event. And so this is something that I like to do. You don't have to do it, but I very much encourage you to do it, is for every event that I have in my sim object, I 
apart from its callback function, I defi define a schedule function. Uh, so that, like, again, I don't have to make decisions locally, don't have to rewrite code. So I just define a schedule next rec send event and then decide in that function when that event should be scheduled. So you'll see that things become complicated. You might have multiple locations in the code that you're trying to schedule one event. So you want to figure, you want to have one function figure that out for you and give you a global perspective rather than like the local perspective that you have there. So it becomes more clear when you go to like step three of this tutorial. Um, so a little bit of So I'm going to do that by copy and pasting the declaration of schedule next request event or next rec send event from slide 51. So this is how I prototype the function. Like I get a tick value, which is when. So whenever I call this function, I, this is mostly like try schedule next rec send event. But even I was tired of long names here. So for the sake of brevity, it's just schedule. So I'm going to ask this function, try to schedule this rec send event or next rec send event at this tick, which is denoted by when, like this. And then this function determines whether it should be like at the same time or sometime later. Uh, it shouldn't be sometime earlier because like, I'm going to give it the time that I think it should be scheduled at the earliest. And then because of some other constraint in the hardware, like some other thing might not be available. So I have to schedule it later even. So this is how I look at it. Again, this is not something you should be like, oh, I definitely need to learn uh, this part of it. This is how I do it. This probably is prone to errors, like mathematical errors on my side, like modeling errors, all of that. But again, like the point of adding it here is for you to see it. Question it, improve it, use it. Um, so now that we have this function that schedules this event for us and we'll implement it later, let's just go ahead and call it in receive next timing request. Receive timing request. Uh, so to do that, I'm copy and pasting the whole code block of slide 52 and overwriting receive timing request with it. So like I selected all of it, overwrite it. Oh, maybe I didn't copy it first. So copy and paste the code block from slide 52, override receive timing request. OK, so all, all it did was add this call to schedule next request rec send event. So and the earliest, at this location, we think that next rec send event should be scheduled is next cycle, right? Right now, we have received this packet at a certain cycle or at a certain time. To impose the latency of this inspection buffer, the earliest it can be scheduled is next cycle. It shouldn't be scheduled this cycle because we're just inserting this item into the buffer right now. Make sense? Clear to everyone? OK. So. Now, let me see, let me cheat off of my slides. Let's see when we get to, wow, OK, that's too many slides in the future. OK, so let's take a step back, go back and implement the easy stuff first. We'll get to the schedule later on. Um, OK, so now, so now let's see uh, what we need to do. So again, we have scheduled. Let's say we trust ourselves to implement that function later. So we have gotten to the stage where we schedule an event to send requests from inspection buffer to memory side port. So now if I were to define the callback function for that event, what would I do in it? I will inspect the first item in the queue. I will call mem side port send timing request, right? Is that clear? The objective of the callback function of next rec send event should be? 
Uh, so now, if you remember, I had defined a function called or declared a function called send packet that was for my convenience. So let's go ahead and define it now and like wrap around send timing request, do some nice things. Um, so uh, to do that, um, let's go ahead and copy and paste slide 53, the code block there. Here. So, so far, we have implemented stuff from CPU side port, but now we're doing things for MEM side port. So, this is the function or the definition that I copy and pasted from the code block in slide 53. Um, all I'm doing, so I'm going to add a panic if blocked. So, remember what that blocked? Um, function returned. So mem site port blocked. So it'll return if blocked packet is not a null pointer. Right? So why are we panicking if we are blocked and this function is called? Like there's no point in send, trying to send a packet when we are already blocked. So Basically, this is where like, pushback happens from the responder to the requester, right? So the requester is like, well, I'm blocked. I'm not going to send anything until I receive a retry. And then I can assume that I can st start sending. And then this process continues until like, everything is processed, right? So we're going to panic. And this is very useful to you because you'll see very soon when you're developing with ports and timing and events that things get complicated. So put these panics there. Like, make sure you uh, like, test every assumption that you have, um, like, just as a scientist also. Uh, and also, we're going to deprintf that we're trying to send a packet. Um, and then what we're going to call is send timing request. So send timing request is already implemented in the base class for request port. If you remember, mem site port was of type uh, request port. And it will return a Boolean. So if we received false, what we need to do is, again, dprintf, we failed to send that packet and track that packet. Right? Otherwise, like the packet is already sent. Like, if you get to this, this imaginary line of code, you can assume that the packet is sent. Make sense? Is there anyone who might have a question about this? So this is where like, you kind of need to know the ports, port classes. Like, I knew that this function is already defined. And you all now know that it's already defined by going through this tutorial. OK, cool. So now let's go ahead and uh, define the callback function for process next request send event. To do that, I'm copy and pasting the code block in slide 54. Uh -huh. And here. Okay. So this is the callback function for next rec send event. OK. We're going to even, what we're going to do is propagate that uh, panic to process next rec send event. So we should never even schedule that f event if mem site port is blocked. Make sense? So we will never even call that so that this panic becomes unnecessary, like in the sense that it will never be called. But this is an assumption, right? This is an assumption that I have. Because I'm saying, well, I'm panicking if my port is blocked there. So there's no point in putting panic there. But I'm going to convince myself that I'm going to do it because I'm a human. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to break any assumption that I have because um, I cannot wrap my head around all the assumptions that I have. Um, I'm also going to panic. Oh, OK, this is a mistake. A typo. So this is not output buffer. This should be inspection buffer, right? 
So when I'm trying to process that, or for the callback function of next rec send and inspection buffer needs to have a packet ready at the, at the time that this function is called, right? So I, I shouldn't even schedule this if there is nothing available at that tick, right? So again, testing our assumption. Uh, this is not a, like, me emphasizing is not a ma matter of, like, morals or ethics. It's, like, super helpful. Like, I mean, apart from being a matter of. Um, so now that I've, like, tested those assumptions, all I need to do is, like, the, the front of inspection buffer, or the first item of inspection buffer, and then call memsiteport.send packet, which I've conveniently defined before. And then just pop. Right? So you might so you might ask, why are you scheduling next rec send event at the end of this function? Um, can anybody try to think about like is it correct to schedule next rec send event cycle? So again, like I'm simulating hardware, right? I've sent something this cycle. Definitely, I cannot send something this cycle, right? Because I've taken that out, right? So the first, the earliest time I can send something is next cycle. But we also saw that we're scheduling it in receive timing request. So why are we scheduling it here? Would it not always not schedule anything? Because, you know, like if we get it, we schedule it next cycle. Uh, and then, like, it'll be sent next cycle, and then this means that this is not going to have anything to send? Is this not going to break the panic? So there's a fairly complicated scenario, rather, like, compared to what we're looking at, uh, that makes this necessary. So let's say, like, your hardware is, like, simulating, simulating, simulating things, sending stuff, everything is happy, but then, like, because memory has limited bandwidth, it stops requesting, returns false. So what ends up happening, if we go back to maybe uh, and you kind of have to use your imagination quite a bit here. So kind of a, accept that these things don't exist and there's a path immediately from here to there. Uh, so when memory side port stops accepting requests, what's going to happen is the CPU doesn't know yet, right? So that hasn't been communicated, and we're actually buffering things. So we're giving this illusion to the CPU that there's more bandwidth to come, so they, like, the CPU can send requests. So this buffer might be full. Okay, so let's say the memory does not come back and tell us to retry before that buffer is full. So now we keep sending false to CPU, or we send false to CPU, right? So then there's some latency to get that retry when we open up this buffer to CPU. So that means that if there might be a scenario where there are a lot of items in the inspection buffer, but CPU is not sending something. Does this kind of at least make sense? Because like the bandwidth that is coming from the CPU side might not be equal to the bandwidth that the memory side can offer. So this imbalance in bandwidth might result in this, right? Like, might result in the size of this, or might influence the size of this inspection buffer. So that's why we also need to schedule that in the case that the CPU has stopped sending requests, but we have requests to send. Yes, yeah. OK, yeah. OK. Yeah. Well, we're at, we have 19 more slides to go. <laughs> but uh, OK, so um, let's see where we are. We are here. And so we did send packet, and then that. OK. OK, so 
So what I'm going to do now, and I'm going to ask for a little bit more time, I think. But uh, so we're going to blitz through completing the request path, so getting requests from CPU side to memory side. And then the response path is fairly similar to the request path. We're going to do the same thing. So what we're going to do just is copy and paste everything, compile, and run. So OK. OK, so we looked at that. We talked about this. OK, so now, again, we talked about having to send request retries. So CPU side port also needs to send re retries when um, that buffer becomes available, right? So we just talked about it. If inspection buffer has room, we need to see if we need to send a re retry and then send it, right? So the moment we realize there's room in the inspection buffer, the next cycle we're going to send a retry. So we need another event to send that retry. OK? Does that make sense? I'm not going to ask that question anymore, because even if it doesn't make sense, you kind of have to bear with me. OK. Uh, OK, so to do that, I'm going to go to slide 56, copy and paste the whole set of functions and declarations for retry event here. So I have an event that sends a retry to what happened? OK. Did I copy and paste it here? No. I have an event that sends a retry. Uh, so. What I'm going to do is add scheduling of that retry event to my send event, rec send event. So to do that, I'm copy and pasting that, or I'm calling that function in here. Again, the order by which you call schedules doesn't matter. Really, my personal preference is I schedule all the other events and then get to my, like the, the same event that I'm inside. Uh, so next step is to define the callback function and the retry, so, uh, the schedule functions for um, the retry event. And we get to scheduling the send event. So to do that, copy and paste the whole code block from slide 56 into inspectorgadget.cc. OK, so to process next re request retry event, we panic if we don't need to retry. And then we just call CPU side port send retry request. And to schedule it, if we need to retry and the retry event is not already scheduled, so the event, fun the event class defines this function scheduled, which tells you whether the, the event is scheduled or not. So if we have already scheduled it, we don't need to schedule it. We schedule it for a line of well, so when. So we align the time we have to schedule it and then schedule it. Uh, this will probably return when every time you call it, but for the sake of correctness, let's just call it. Then the next step is define schedule next request send event. So we have kind of created every function except for this. So to do that, copy and paste the whole code block from slide 58, like the first one, into inspectorgadget.cc. So what I'm checking for, again, these are the things that I'll, I also panicked about in the two other functions, is that if I have a port available and if I have any item. So, so if there is an item in inspection buffer, right, and there's a port available, and next rec send event is not scheduled, I will calculate a scheduled time that is the align of inspection buffer first ready time.
right? So kind of when is kind of useless here. Uh, but uh, you can also do this. So sorry for the. So the maximum of when and that. And then for that, you're going to need algorithm, which you have to import by include or include. OK, so then there's the receive request retry. So please um, read that on your own. The details are, I think you can figure that out. But so while we're waiting for compilation, I'm going to go through a bunch of slides. So I would ask everyone to save their progress so far in some uh, folder. So what I'm going to do is rename this to bootcamp mine. So, and go to materials, zero, sorry, zero 03 ports, step one, source and copy and paste the bootcamp directory from there to gem5 source. And make sure to change the name of Sconscript to Sconscript mine so that Gem5 doesn't try to compile two inspector gadgets. So make sure that. And then here you should have the complete versions of everything here. So this is the declaration of inspector gadget for the first step. So you're fairly there. Statistics is important. Um, so, like, we develop some objects to, like, get statistics, right? Not just execution time, like, number of hits, all of those. So, uh, to add statistics to uh, some object, you need to kind of define a struct for the stats of it, which, inher which should inherit from statics, statistics group, which is defined in base statistics and base stats group.hh. So, need to include these two. Um, then statistics has a bunch of uh, units or types of stats that you can measure, scalar, histogram, vector 2D, uh, formula. So they can say, I have this formula that I want you to evaluate. Uh, but I usually try my best to only use scalar and then do all the processing of data on my own, except for like histograms that I really need, a histo like, need to start sampling stuff. So you define a constructor for it. Uh, and you need to, so if you look at the constructor of statistics group, you'll see that it takes a, a group star as its input. So if you go back to sim object, you see that sim object is in it itself is a group. So we can pass the inspector gadget uh, pointer to the constructor of statistics group. Um, then a bunch of other func like events that relate to sending retries and res forwarding responses. Uh, and we're going to declare an object of stats, all, all the other functions here. And let's go to And this is the constructor of inspector gadget. This is just for forwarding requests from one side to the other and responses from the other side to the first side. Uh, the init function, so we talked about it a little bit. So init function is where, uh, like, as one of the initialization steps in Gem5. So in this function, you can assume all the ports are connected. So this is where. Like, you're going to tell people to construct those internal maps for routing. So for init of inspector gadget, I'm telling CPU side port to send range change. So CPU side port of inspector gadget will tell every other port to start asking for ranges and start constructing the internal maps. Then that is that. 
Yeah, and so now let's go ahead and compile Gem5 really quick. Scans, oh. Scans. Build. No. Gem5.lpt minus J8. Hopefully, we wouldn't run into any compilation errors, which we did. Uh, Is this? Oh, OK. Yes. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that the materials kind of add, build up on each other. So there's another scan script that you have to make sure is not compiled, uh, the one in hello some object. So make sure to rename that as well and recompile. I can stop right now, I think. Well, this is where we are. So we talked about this. We compiled. And then that. Defining that. Just that. OK. I'm going to show this. <laughs> OK, so if you follow with the tutorial all the way up to slide 72, you're going to create your own configuration that script that uses this inspector gadget. And if you run this command there, you'll see is en enabling like, um, oh, so maybe slowly. OK. So what you can see is that it's getting requests and forwarding them, and getting responses and forwarding them. You can correlate the ticks to latencies imposed by the two buffers that we have. We unfortunately didn't get to uh, modeling the response path. Statistics, you can add them. Please follow with the tutorial to actually see the statistics. And we're almost done. So. If you run the first example, you'll see that inspector 0, so there are two ins instances of inspector gadget. Inspector 0 forwarded 22 requests and forwarded 22 responses. So those two have to be like, equal, because we don't want to miss things. And then inspector 1 forwarded 18, and 18 requests and forwarded 18 responses. Does it make sense why the requests and responses have to be the same? Right? We don't want to drop things. This is end of step one. Sorry, it took way longer than I expected. This is end of sim object for now. <laughs> yes. So real quick, uh, what's in step two and step three? So in step two, uh, we add another event to inspect. It doesn't necessarily do anything specific. So we don't add a sim object or any other class to do the functionality of that. We're just imposing another cycle of latency. Um, and we add this other event in between, like getting the packets, putting them in the inspection buffer, and then sending them to the memory. You'll see that it actually complicates things, because we now have events that are sending pushbacks to each other. Handling that is a little bit more complicated, because it comes to scheduling, not just function calls. Um, then in, in that step, we define inspection uh, by basically like as basically like attaching a tag to every request and then getting that tag or taking that tag uh, off of the response that we get. We use this tag to be a sequence number, so we generate our own sequence numbers for requests. And then we see the sequence numbers as they come in and we count the displacement of response report response and requests. So like this is like how you can observe that your memory controller is like reordering requests that it gets. So you can count the number of displacements between the requests and responses. In this third step, we actually like try to model uh, something that is much, much closer to the first diagram. So uh, we, uh, like we, are mod we, we model the inspection uh, stage to, ha to be able to do multiple inspections every cycle. So let's say you have multiple inspectors and then you also model the latency more than one cycle. And then 
try to see how you actually model it in hardware. It's not very trivial, but it is not very complicated. Uh, then the fourth step is actually like, let's say you have this many inspection units, uh, but the inspection units themselves are also pipelined. So the slides for that are not um, ready yet, but you should be able to figure that out on your own if you follow all the way up to the end of step three. So this is how basically your sim object is going to look like. So you have a sim object as an inspection buffer, multiple inspection units. The inspection units themselves might be pipelined. So they have a front end latency, which is like the latency, the minimum latency that the, every packet needs to spend in a, every inspection unit before you can inject another packet into the same function, uh, to the same inspection unit. Uh, and then like you can try to play around with parameters that define these things or set these things to see when your inspector gadget becomes a bottleneck, when it doesn't become a bottleneck, you can use the traffic generator to measure the bandwidth that you're seeing. You should probably play around with it until you see that same bandwidth as memory. Um, so it's fairly helpful to learn how to do statistics. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that. Um, but uh, I will be happy to coordinate with email, like answer any questions that you might have. Also, please feel free to point out typos, mistakes, like, like, like theoretical mistakes, mathematical mistakes that I've made, and like maybe like that, uh, like Connor mentioned, maybe find that function that aligns the time. Tell me to update it. Thank you so much if you do it. And this is it for me. There's a question.